And also, I'm so glad to be the last speaker because, <laughs> well, not for that reason. <laughs> But because I've got to know most everybody, and I feel like I'm talking to family now, and not, not a bunch of strangers. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, I've always wanted to come to Seattle ever since Perry Como told me, the bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't think he went to the Eastern Mountains of Arizona, or else he would have said, Arizona, but <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad to see the blue skies are out, and uh, they are pretty blue, and the rain keeps them clear and clean, and it is a beautiful place to be, and I've been so excited now for several weeks since John was kind enough to recommend me and uh, Skeeter to accept me. Uh, I do have a lot to say, and I I may have to edit down my material in order to get through this and to engage you and I'm sure uh, a, a good discussion. Um, I just have a few thoughts about the Bible. Since this has been a favorite topic I, of our conference. To me, the Bible is a compilation of God-inspired, God-breathed scriptures. And however that came about is not my point, but I believe that these are God-breathed, and by that nature, they are uh, true and authoritative. Uh, Paul's writings are described as scripture by Peter, and Paul describes his own words in 1 Corinthians 14 as commands of the Lord. And we have, uh, we, we have a, of course, the 2 Timothy 3 verse that, uh, that all scripture is God-breathed, and it is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. Now, I want to talk about that point, because Scripture it does not only equip us for good works, but it equips us to love one another. And I want to turn uh, to a verse in, uh, uh, let's see, this would be in Romans 15. And uh, let me read this passage to you and, and see the connection with the Word of God and loving one another. Um, and it's talking about scripture that was written in the past. Old Testament, as we would say. But we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those not strong and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good for his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, as it has been written, the curses of those cursing you fell on me. But whatever things were written before were written for our instruction, that through patience and encouragement of the scriptures we might find hope. And may the God of patience and encouragement give you to mind the same thing among one another, according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord and one mouth you may glorify the God of our Lord, a God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So, so even the Old Testament scriptures inspired for instruction teach us how to love one another. And in the process of that, we glorify God. So they are profitable. Uh, and, uh, and not to be uh, treated lightly or discarded. Of course, you have to know what covenant you're under, <laughs> of course, and it's foolish to read uh, uh, you know, Leviticus and, and take that as the word of God for yourself when it's clear that that covenant has uh, been superseded by the new covenant. Uh, and, and in fact, when, when we are uh, taught and uh, reproofed for, uh, uh, that we might walk in righteousness and we do good works, we are fulfilling the prime directive that we love one another as Christ loved us. I, I know I've heard a lot about Jesus being uh, in the scriptures, but there's Jesus' people that the scriptures are, are training us to love. And, and that's loving Jesus, 
when we love one another. And I, and I, I just want us to realize that good works are really big with God and His commandments, and we are trained in walking in those commandments through the instruction of Old Testament saints and their examples, as well as the didactic passages in the New Testament and the, the historical narratives throughout the Bible. But the Bible to me is, in fact, I, I don't even have my Old Testament here. I just have an old ratty-tat uh, interlinear right here that's, that's falling apart like Keith says. I've glued it so many times. I even glued it the, the day I, I came here. I glued it one more time so it'd hold together for this conference. So <laughs> it's, uh, hopefully it will. You know, when Jesus talks about, uh, you know, not living by bread alone, but by every word uh, proceeding from God. Um, you know, the spiritual food we, we need as spirit beings is, it's, it's, and you know what I mean. There's something about how this word, which Jesus says is spirit and life, and alive and active, powerful, it, it, uh, when you approach it by faith, you know, it's, if, you, if, you, if you read this without the hearing of faith, it's just words. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, I'm in the printing business. It's just ink on paper. You know? But boy, when you hear or read, or, uh, of course, there's, a, there's no exhortations to read the Bible uh, in the New Testament. It's, it's just hearing it uh, for the reasons we've discussed, uh, a lot of illiteracy. But what, when you mix with faith what you're hearing, reading, that's when it comes alive. And that's the Holy Spirit working through faith to illumine it and to uh, transform you by that renewing of your mind. So uh, I'm really big on the Word of God. I, I actually love the Scriptures. But as I, uh, I've analogized, uh, my wife has received many poems from me, you know, romantic poems over the years. I've been married now 44 years, coming up in a month. A lot of poems. But her romance, believe it or not, is not with my poems. <laughs> the fact that uh, she knows intuitively that it's from me and it points to me and my feelings toward her is she gets it. I have trouble understanding saints who have a romance with the Bible and not with the Lord God who loves them with a great love. It's, it's, that seems bizarre. <laughs> I can't relate to that. I've never loved the Bible that way. It's always pointed me to the Lord himself. So that, that's just a little hard to understand that. <laughs> People having that kind of a relationship with their Bible. Uh, so that, that's just basically my, my point. I, I'm going to be getting into the scriptures, the word of God today, uh, quite a bit because I am going to be talking about something that I have never come across, never read or been taught. It, 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 it began 15 years ago or so. Uh, and I'll show you the passage I was reading and I'll, I kind of, I, I want to take you on a journey of discovery that I have had in my own life because yeah, I've been a Berean. I'm always testing everything. I'm always trying to embrace the good, uh, hold fast to that good, you know, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And, and so I, I am not wired to just accept everything hook, line, and sinker. It's just uh, the way God has made and gifted me and trained me uh, is, is, is been to question. In fact, I have a lot in common with Skeeter in that I was taught a great hermeneutic uh, when I was 21 by the pastor teacher in Oklahoma. And then, just like you, Skeeter, when I applied his hermeneutic to his doctrine of dispensationalism, wow, it didn't stand up at all. So I wrote him a paper when I was 20, I think in 1976, I was 24. And I, I was so excited that I discovered that he was wrong and he probably loved the truth like me and he wanted to know the truth. <laughs> 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 
And what he said was, get out and stay away from my sheep. Ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I wrote about this incident in uh, the paper of the Berean Spirit, a sailed ally of the Christian faith, and it's on the flash drive. But anyway, this hermeneutic has stood the test of time, and it, it, was, it was God's providence that, uh, that he was in my life, and he, and he taught me them, because they are solid principles. So, in the process of always thinking this way toward Scripture, I read, I was reading in my 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 text about um, God. In fact, this study is going to be about God. But where I'm headed, I really want to get to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's my goal. So, God willing, I won't miss that goal. And we're going to, that's, that, that is something I didn't hear much about when I was at Reformed Theological Seminaries, the ministry of the Spirit. I can't remember ever hearing much about the Holy Spirit. And even at Trinity, I remember hearing more about the Holy Spirit, but not the pervasive ministry that he has uh, that I see in Scripture. It, it was a pretty academic place. But the teaching about the Holy Spirit, the ministry of righteousness, this glorious ministry that has eclipsed the law's ministry. So that's, that's where I'm headed. In order to do that, though, I've got to talk about the Godhead and, and specifically the role of the Holy Spirit within the Godhead. Okay? And, that's, and that's where we're going to launch into the ministry of the Spirit, but that, that's where we're headed. So, in 1 Corinthians 8, I'm reading this passage about um, the Godhead, essentially. He, that word theon is found in Acts chapter 17, but it, 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 for Godhead. But this uh, verse, beginning in verse uh, 5, oh, well, let, let me begin in verse 4. Then concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God except one. For even if some are called gods, either in heaven or on the earth, even as there are many gods and many lords, but to us is one God, and now we get into a definitive definition of our God, the one God, versus the idols that surrounded Paul in his day. And here's what he says. Here's the definitive definition. But to us, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, from whom, ek, from whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom, dia, are all things, and we through him. And I just thought, you know, why did it stop there? Isn't there another person in this God, this one God? And I, and I saw in the back of my, my mind, I was thinking, that's really strange. You know, I, I thought, why did he leave the Holy Spirit out there? So I noticed in the epistles, he, he begins every epistle with these words, God, a grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says those very words, no deviation, in Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Philemon, but to 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, what, this is a salutation in the name of God, or from God, to the saints. Why did he leave the Holy Spirit out? Why only the Father and the Son? Then I, uh, 
I can't. What's that? Is that me? No, sorry guys. I um. Oh, okay. I, th I thought, I, I used to have a phone with that ringtone. I'm still, I'm still hearing it. <laughs> I said, I go, whoo, <laughs> I, I flinch. And in 1 John 1, 3, again, this is my journey I'm on. I'm running across these passages and I'm asking the question, why did God in his re uh, inspired word leave out mention of the Holy Spirit? So in John um, 1 John 1, 3, we read this. We announce to you what we have seen and what we have heard, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's all it says. No mention of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Well, I... I, I uh, I don't, understand, I don't understand why, again, the Holy Spirit is, is left out of it. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, um, bear with me as I find it here, 13, 14. Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's mentioned there, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, but not in John. Our fellowship is not with there's no mention of him, just the Father and the Son. Okay, I'll get around to why, why those two are harmonious <laughs> in a minute. But let me show you these other passages that uh, the Lord was beginning to show me here. Uh, the next one would be uh, Matthew 11, um, verse 27. All things were yielded up to me by my Father, says Jesus, and no one knows the Son... In the Greek, it's no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that we're talking about who knows who within the Godhead. And the reason is, is because he goes on to say, except the, uh, no one knows the Father except the Son, and, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. The Father, reveal the Father. So it goes from who knows who within the Godhead to who knows the Father among human beings. And I find it interesting, again, that the Holy Spirit is not mentioned as knowing the Father or the Son, if indeed He is a third co-equal part, member, person of the Godhead. And I flinch when I say person. I want you to know. <laughs> I've talked about this with Keith. He is so exalted as a person. It's not, it seems blasphemous to even say he's a person. But then I realize that we are persons. He's, and we're made in his image. He has a personal relationship with us. We are persons because he is a person. But he is so exalted. It's a joke. Uh, we can't equate person with human here. We, person is a very, very exalted being <laughs> when it comes to God, okay? I just want to get that out there. So when I say person, uh, it's very respectfully said. <laughs> All right. But so, so within, but no one knows the Son and, except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned as a person knowing Him, both of them, both of the persons mentioned. I, uh, and, then I, and then I go to John chapter 6 and I find this interesting verse in uh, verses 45 and 6. So that everyone who hears and learns from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God, or literally being from alongside God, he has seen the Father. Again, excluding the Holy Spirit, only the Son has seen the Father. We talked about this a few minutes ago, <laughs> this very verse. And of course, that means really seeing the fully exalted Father in, in all his glory, not like the, 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 what, the tail of his robe or whatever Isaiah saw, but the Father in 
all his glory, something no man can see. Yeah, we've got the Son alone seeing the Father. John 8, 29 um, was my next interesting discovery. Uh, here's the way this reads. And the one who sent me is with me. The Father did not leave me alone. Well, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking by now, right? Is the Father the only one that can be with Jesus so he's not alone? <laughs> why not the Holy Spirit? Is he not a person that can be with Jesus? I mean, why, what's, what's the deal here? So think about this. How is the Father with Jesus? He's with him in spirit. His spirit is with Jesus. Okay, that's a clue where we're headed here. Uh, John 10, 27 and 30. Um, I love this passage. Uh, we're mentioned in this passage. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never, ever perish. Real strong in the Greek. It's a very strong, never, ever. And not anyone shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So you can't pluck us out of Jesus' hand or my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now think about that. We have only Jesus and the Father mentioned as being possessive of us. And he says, I and the Father are one. No mention of the Holy Spirit here, but it's just I, Jesus, and the Father are one. Now we go back to that verse in 1 Corinthians 8. God is one. But we have two clear, at least two here, persons. They know each other. They relate to each other. They love each other. They, 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 you know, they, they, one submits you know, to the other, and the other, from whom are all things and through whom are all things. So there's clearly two persons at least here. God is one. Now, how is that possible? And, and I'm, my hypothesis is, is that they are one in spirit. And so we read that God is spirit. God is spirit. God is one. They are one in spirit. That's, that's what I begin to think here in this in journey. Um, John 16, 2 and 3 is, is just a kind of an aside passage. It, it, it's just a kind of a corroborating verse, 16, 2 and 3. He says, um, They will put you out of the synagogues, or synagogue, but an hour is coming that everyone killing you will think that he bears a service to God. And they will do these things to you because they do not know the Father nor me. That's all he says. They don't know the Father or me. So who then is the Holy Spirit? Why is he left out of all these passages? And uh, the, the idea that, well, he's left out because he's to glorify the Lord. I don't, uh, the Lord Jesus. And he's, he, you know, Jesus said, and he will glorify me. And therefore, he's not mentioned anywhere. And somehow that's supposed to glorify God. I, I don't buy that very, that argument because the Holy Spirit is mentioned all over the place. He is front and center in passage after passage after passage. And one we just read about the comfort of the Holy Spirit, you know. And uh, I, I just don't find that convincing as to why he is absent in all these texts. So who is the Holy Spirit and what is his relation to the Godhead? Okay, that's... Uh, that's where this journey has taken me to this point. I, I see a two-person, a two-member Godhead at this point, and now the Holy Spirit. So for that, and my hypothesis is now this, that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit which is holy, belonging to the Father, God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is 
the one spirit belonging to the Father and the Son. In Romans 8, uh, I want to share this passage with you in light of what I've just said. Now, we know that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But then in verse uh, 8, uh, Paul says, And those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now he's going to define the Spirit of God. Okay, we've got, watch this. But if anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, th he is not his. But if Christ is in you, so now we have Christ is in you because his Spirit is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the, the Spirit, your Spirit is now alive because of righteousness imputed to it. You know, now your spirit is alive. You're in union with Christ's spirit. He's alive. Your spirit is now alive. It's in union with his. But if the spirit of the one having raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now who's that? The one who raised Jesus from the dead would be God the Father. He dwells in you. So if the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will also make your mortal bodies live through the indwelling of his spirit in you. So the picture then is the spirit of Christ is in us. The spirit of the Father is, is in us. We have an indwelling uh, of two. Uh, so therefore, we see this, this same teaching uh, from, from in the words of John, and it was quoted earlier, I think today or yesterday, maybe John Zins did, um, in, in John chapter 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make a, a, our dwelling, or a, 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 a dwelling place with him, an abode. We Father and me, Jesus, will come and indwell the one who loves me. And so we just read how that happens in Romans 8. The Spirit of the Father and the Son indwell us, and we become a holy temple, a holy of holies, as it were, for God to indwell. You talk about amazing truth. You are so holy to God and pure that He is able to indwell you as a temple, a holy of holies kind of a temple. Wow. Um, in, in 2 Corinthians 3, we're going to find out who are our letter having been inscribed in our hearts, being known and read by all men, it having been made plain that you are Christ's letter, you are Christ's epistle, served by us, not having been inscribed by ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. Okay, now we have a link. Christ is identified with the Spirit of the living God. Toward the end of this chapter, Verse 16, he says, about the, this verse was read today, <laughs> I know. But whenever it, uh, uh, let me start with verse 15. But until today, when Moses is uh, read, a veil lies on their heart. But whenever uh, one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And then he says, and the Lord is the Spirit. Now he identifies who the Spirit is, the Lord. And we have one Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the Spirit. Um, he, and he says, where the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Jesus Christ is, there is liberty. And he ends the, the, the chapter, and we are being changed into the same image from glory to glory as from, and it literally says, from Lord Spirit. From the Lord the Spirit. <laughs> so 
so here we have the identity of Jesus Christ as being the Spirit, the person of the Spirit. Therefore, watch this. We, I go over to Revelation now and, and uh, begin in chapter 2. We've got seven churches being addressed here in chapter 2 and 3. Every one of these, chapter, or these uh, uh, letters to these seven Asian churches begins with a description of Jesus in his glory. Uh, for example, to the Ephesian church, which uh, starts off, he says, uh, These things says the one holding the seven stars in his right hand and walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And uh, to Smyrna, these things says the first and the last who became dead and lived. To Pergamos, he says, the one having the sharp two-edged sword and, and so forth. Yeah, uh, Thyatira, the, the one having his eyes as a flame of fire and so forth. Uh, Sardis, the one having the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and then Philadelphia, the, the holy one, the true one, the one having the key of David, and finally Laodicea, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the head of the creation of God. Okay, these are all descriptions, obviously, of Jesus Christ. And how does every one of these little letters to these seven churches, they, it's, it's toward the end of every one of these letters, and it says, Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches on every single one. So Jesus Christ is the one who just spoke, but the Spirit is credited with speaking. Uh, it's, it's just another way that Christ is identified with the Spirit as a person. Okay? Um, And now let's get into the discussion about the paraclete. And, and I tell you what, I want to do, do just a little little pause, and I want to share this with you because if, if this is, uh, I'm following a tradition here of maybe uh, controversial things, but I do want to encourage you with a couple of quotes <laughs> that, uh, that I found encouraging. Uh, this, this was written uh, by John Robinson in, in his final words to the Mayflower Pilgrims in 1620. And it's in my article on the Berean spirit. Uh, but it's, it's so apropos here. So they're about to leave from England and, and go to the New World. This is 1620, and he tells his, um, his pilgrim friends, The Lord knows whether we should live to see our faces again. <clears throat> But whether the Lord has appointed it or not, I charge you before God and His blessed angels that you follow me no further than you have seen me follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of His, be ready to receive it as ever you were to receive any truth by my ministry. For I am confident the Lord has more truth and light yet to break forth out of His holy word. For my part, I bewail the state and condition of the Reformed churches who are come to a full stop in religion and will go no further than the instruments of their first Reformation. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go beyond what Luther saw. For whatever part of his will our good God has imparted and revealed unto Calvin, they will rather die than embrace it. And the Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left by that great man of God who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented. For though they were burning and shining lights in their times, yet God had not revealed his whole counsel to them. But were they now living, they would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. I remind you of our church covenant, whereby we promise to receive whatever light or truth shall be made known to us from his written word. And I exhort you to take heed what you receive as truth, that you do well to examine it and compare it and weigh it with other scriptures of truth before you receive it. A little Berean spirit lingo. And then listen to this. Robert Whit, uh, Whitelaw, writing in 1980, he observed the same anti-Berean spirit sentiment that was embedded in the church of his day said who then among us pastors included on hearing of new insights on scripture by fellow believers even if contrary to cherished views are willing to search the scripture alone 
setting aside confessions, creeds, commentaries, tradition, and even Puritan divines with all prothumia, which means eagerness, great desire, to see if these things be so. By the way, I was thumbing through this Mulkey book, and I ran across a, an interesting quote on page 27. He says, Theologians are not infallible in the interpretation of Scripture. It may therefore happen in the future, as it has in the past, that interpretations of the Bible, long confidently received, must be modified or abandoned. This change of view as to the true meaning of the Bible may be painful to the church, but it does not in the least impair the authority of Scripture. They remain infallible. We are merely convicted of having mistaken their meaning. In 1999, I was at a conference in Orlando, it was an R.C. Sproul conference, and Sinclair Ferguson, he, he, I got a tape, and I was listening to it recently, and, and I thought, wow, let me write that down, and here's what Sinclair said, and they were going back and forth, you know, debating eschatology or something, and Sinclair said these appropriate words. Really, what we are all trying to do is to understand what the scriptures teach and blow the systems blow the terminology. None of us is here to defend a school of thought. We're all here seeking to understand the teaching of the scriptures, which is why we're able to learn from one another in the course of the expositions. Amen. <laughs> I thought that was good. So now let's go to John 14 and explore this interesting relationship uh, that we have and I, what I'm trying to show you is how Jesus Christ identifies himself with the Spirit. We've just seen definitions clear as day that the Lord is the Spirit, but, but it's, 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 it's good to see how Scripture uh, corroborates itself. So over here in John 14, I need a drink. Where's my, can you hand me that? Is that my glass? Right down there on the floor. Thank you. To set the stage, these, these disciples are freaking out. They are about to, they're, they've been told they're going to lose Jesus. He's going away. He has been their life for three years. They're very dependent on him. He's their expected Messiah. He, they believe in him as being the Christ, the Son of God. They, are, they can't emotionally wrap their heads around the concept of him going away. Jesus, in uh, in turn, is seeking to uh, comfort them and assure them that they're not going to lose him. <laughs> they're going to be even better. And say, Paraclete, uh, he, he will give you another Paraclete. And we you know Paracleo is to, in the verb form, it means to come alongside someone to uh, aid them in some way. I will petition the Father that he may remain with you forever, that, that is the paraclete, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor know him. But you know him, you know this paraclete. Why do you know him? How do you know him? Because he abides with you right now. See, he's talking about the paraclete in the third person, but he's, he's saying, that's me. I am abiding with you. He's the paraclete. Uh, I am the paraclete. <laughs> so, so when I see the paraclete mentioned in the third person, I know that's thrown off the whole theological Christian world, you know, and it's thrown them off to say, and this is my opinion, to see the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, as a third individual member of the Godhead. But... Jesus is so identifying himself both in the first and third persons with this paraclete. I just want you to see how, how it reads. Uh, okay, but you know him for he abides with you and shall be in you. So right now, I, the paraclete, am with you, standing in your midst. 
but there's coming a time soon that I will not be standing in your midst, but I will actually be indwelling you. <laughs> now that's a switch. I will not leave you orphans. I, I, first person, am coming to you. I, the Lord Jesus, your, the paraclete you know, who lives with you and abides with you, I'm going to be in you. How am I going to do that? And he defines the spirit then, the, the, the paraclete, as the Holy Spirit over in verse uh, 35. I have spoken these things to you, abiding with you. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name, he shall teach you all things and shall remind you of all the things that I said to you. I, uh, I Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives this peace. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be timid. You heard that I said to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. <laughs> I, you see that? He, he, he goes between third person, the paraclete is coming, to I am coming. <laughs> it is a very close association. I'm not leaving you alone. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> I'm coming back. I'm going to indwell you. My spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of, of me, which is holy, is going to be in you. That's why you're going to be better off. You're going to be empowered by my spirit. You're going to be taught by my spirit. You're going to be emboldened by my spirit. You're going to give your life because of the indwelling spirit, my spirit. Um not be left alone. In, in John 15, 26, I want, to, I want to compare that verse with Galatians 4, 6. And follow me here. John 15, 26. And when the Comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Now, notice, notice this. Remember, all things are from the Father, and we for Him. But that phrase, all things are from the Father. This is the protocol that Jesus abides by. He says, I'm going to send the paraclete. I, I mis misread here, comforter. It's, it's in my translation. But you, By the way, the word comforter used to mean uh, something else. It used to mean to make strong and to fortify in the Old English. And that's where they got that word translated uh, in some of the Bibles as comforter, but it meant something totally different <laughs> back then. Uh, so when the paraclete comes, I, and I will send him to you. So he is kind of a, uh, uh, initiating the sending, and, he, and, and yet he goes through the protocol of he has to go through the Father, because the Father uh, will send that Spirit because the Spirit is from him. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father shall send in my name. And earlier in chapter 14, he says, I will petition the Father, and he will give you the paraclete there. So, so Jesus is asking the Father, and, and because Jesus is sending his Spirit, and the Spirit, because it's of Jesus Christ, is, 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 is his person. It's not just a force. The Holy Spirit is His person, His personage. Um, we read in 1 Corinthians 2 that uh, no man knows the thoughts of a person except the Spirit in him. And, and no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The Spirit knows the person <laughs> and what the person is thinking. And so Jesus is sending His Spirit, which is his person, to, uh, to his disciples and to all believers at Pentecost, including us. We, we, we have the same promise, uh, th indirectly here, of, of the same paraclete indwelling us. Uh, but notice in 1526, 
And when the paraclete comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, all things are from him, that one will witness concerning me. And in Galatians uh, 4.6, okay, I failed to mark that one to my markers. Um, and because you are sons, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So there you go. It's God. He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, who is the paraclete, the Spirit of God, into your hearts. This is just as Jesus said would happen. I will send this paraclete from the Father to you, and he will indwell you. And that will be my abiding presence with you forever. It's like, it's like I think you were saying, Keith, we, we're never going to be separated from Jesus Christ, ever. Ever. Forever. Think about that. <laughs> I, um, I want to talk about the ministry of the Spirit, but up, up to this point, I thought it would just be good just to take a little break and just gather your impressions, your thoughts, your comments, your, and before, because the, the ministry of the Spirit is, uh, is, is, is a little subject all its own, and I, I wanted to uh, just take a break and just see if you had anything you wanted to say or comments at all. <laughs> yes, go ahead. <coughs> to uh, say, uh, when you were talking yesterday, I wrote, I wrote down a couple of things you said that consistent with what I've been sharing. One, th one was uh, Jesus. Okay, is this better? We're just moving closer to you, yeah. Okay, uh, where you said Jesus was pouring out his spirit upon his bride, the church, to carry on his ministry. And then you said, the spirit, which is Jesus. <laughs> well, I thought, whoa, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Share that. Okay, well, that's, that's certainly consistent with what I'm saying. Uh, okay, the ministry of the spirit. Uh, this is big. Ready? Remember what Jesus said? The spirit gives life. The flesh profits what? <laughs> and apart from me, you can do... <laughs> Okay, so what does that mean? The Spirit must do everything. Total, pervasive, absolute, complete ministry in our life. And why is that the case? Okay, we are part of a covenant in which there is one party making the promises. We have a one-party covenant of grace. I write about this in the Salvation of Israel paper that's on your flash drive. This, a mediator is not of one, but God is one, is one of my favorite verses in Galatians. It's Galatians 3.20. And in that, in the law covenant, there were two parties agreeing. One, I will keep your commandments, and the other, I will bless. And the, the one who's blessed to say, I will curse if you don't keep. So there's, there, there is a two-party arrangement, both agreeing to do something uh, dependent upon, uh, you know, one party had to perform and the other party had to perform. So, and it was uh, signed and sealed in animal blood and so forth by Moses the mediator uh, arbitrated this. But now we have a new covenant that is based on the Abrahamic covenant in which Abraham was asleep while God covenanted with him and made these great promises to Abraham that he would inherit the world, father of many nations, and that all families of the earth would be blessed in him. So Jesus Christ, born under the law, fulfills the law of righteousness. Now we have an objective standard for justification. He is now able to prove that he is the unspotted lamb because he is the one that did these things and lived as it says, do these things and live. Well, Jesus actually did them 
and he lived, meaning came out of death. So the law functioned to justify Jesus Christ. And that was important because now he can justify the seed of Abraham and fulfill that covenant. So he comes to confirm the promises made to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this covenant, the new covenant that God made with Israel, is, uh, is fulfilling the earlier Abrahamic promise. Okay? We, we, this is, you all know this. But just like the Abrahamic promise, it is a one-party covenant. In Jeremiah 31, you know, it says, I will make a covenant with the house of Israel, and I will forgive their sins and iniquities, and, and, uh, and uh, everyone shall know the Lord, and, uh, and no one needs to say, know the Lord. Everybody knows me. There's, there's nothing in that promise that is conditional upon Israel to do anything. It's all God saying, I will forgive and forget your sins and iniquities. Uh, and I will put my laws into your mind and heart. And, and in other words, you're going to know me and you're going to be forgiven. And it's just, <laughs> it's all him. It's all God. And, and so we, we go to Hebrews 3 and 4 and we find out that the people of God are supposed to enter into his rest. Why is that? Because he did all the work in Christ. Now we are resting in Christ our Sabbath. We are a people at rest. We've entered into his rest which fulfills the provisions, the conditions of this covenant where God does everything through his spirit while we rest in him and by faith Watch him work through us the good works, the miracles, the, the conversions, the, all the things that the Spirit does through us. But we do it while we're in a state of faith rest, you know. So, so that's why the ministry of the Spirit is key to everything. It is the means by which God lives out and fulfills this new covenant with us. We being grafted into Israel so we can participate in that covenant. Um, and so, I guess that you would say that the first thing that really happens in this ministry of the Spirit is that we, be, we are baptized in the Spirit. And, and Jesus made that uh, John the Baptist talked about that. The one coming after me will baptize you uh, with the Holy Spirit. And uh, Peter talks about that after the conversion of the Gentiles there, uh, or the uh, Cornelius. Uh, he, he, he says, well, when the Spirit comes upon Cornelius, he sees that as the fulfillment of Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's, the, it's the coming of the paraclete into the lives of the believers, beginning at Pentecost, and then forever after, when the gospel is preached and believed, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ himself, comes to indwell his people. Now what's fascinating to me is that in so doing, we uh, are made alive. Uh, we're made alive according to Romans 6. Together with Christ, we, we share in his resurrection. We also share in his death to sin. He died on the cross being made sin. When we are baptized into Christ by the ministry of the Spirit, we become partakers of his death to sin, our spirit being united with his spirit. Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, the one you, who uh, joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him implied. We're one spirit now with the Lord. His life is now our life. His death to sin is our death to sin. Uh, 
Our resurrection is now our newness of life. Uh, I, I, I can't say just how significant it is to go from death in sin to l death to sin. Okay? <laughs> to go from spiritual death to spiritual resurrection life. And along with all this, his justification, where God declared him righteous on the cross, belongs to us too because we're in Christ. His, we're united with him. His justification is now our justification, and so vicariously we are the justified. And if we're the justified, that means we have passed out of judgment, and now we're entering life eternal. We are living post-judgment in an eternal life state. Isn't that great? You can never die your spirit. Because if Christ can die, you can die. But he can't die any longer. Sin no longer holds him. He is eternal, and you are eternal. And... Uh, you have life forever and ever in union with Christ. can never be taken away from you. Um, and so, if you are dead to sin, it goes on to say that you are now enslaved to God, enslaved to righteousness, and freed from sin. And I wrote about all this in my paper. <laughs> Dead to sin and alive to God, which is on your flash drive. But in Romans 6, because of this great truth of baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ, we are told in verse 11, So then, consider, meaning count this as a fact, yourselves to be truly dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if you're dead to sin, what does that mean? It means you can't sin. Now, you know, people say, well, wait a minute, I sin, I definitely sin. You're wrong. But, but let, me, let me just share with you, and I write about this in that same Dead to Sin, Alive to God article. What, what we have going on here is a, an inner man, outer man <laughs> situation. You, we have a spirit uh, and it's also associated with our heart and mind, so it's, it gets a little complicated, but what we, let, let's just say we have an inner man, or some uh, political correctness would say inner self, <laughs> inner person, but that inner self is now the one in union with Christ. That person is as righteous as God is person, and that's the true you, by the way, because what does Paul say? I have been crucified. The old inner self, your old spirit, was dead in sin and not alive to God, was an enemy of God. But now in your inner being, you're now united with Christ. You're now dead to sin because he died to sin. You're now alive to God because he's resurrected unto newness of life. Now you live to God just as he lives to God the Father. And so in Romans 14 it says, no one lives to himself. Whether you live, you live to the Lord. Whatever you do, you do unto the Lord. No one lives to himself because in your inner man, the true you, you don't live to yourself. You live only to God. You only do good works. We are defined by who we are inwardly, not who we are according to the flesh. Like, go back to Galatians 3.20, or 2, is it 2.20? Sorry, 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. That's the old self. I'm dead. Dead and buried, <laughs> gone. And it is no longer I, the old self, who lives. But now, Christ lives in me. Now I have a union of life. It's not just me sola, but now 
it's Christ in me. It's Christ united with me that lives. And the life I live, I live by faith. The righteous now walk by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, you died with, you know, on that cross. You died. And now you have been raised unto newness of life in union with Jesus Christ and who indwells you. You in him and he in you and the Father in you. It's, it's, it's a oneness with the Godhead. And, and so it's not a surprise. I know it's a shocking passage. I, again, I write about this in more detail, much more detail in, first, uh, in my paper. But um, over in 1 John 3, it, it says that uh, everyone abiding in him does not sin. Everyone sinning has not seen him nor known him. Now we're talking about the inner man here. Anyone sinning has not seen him nor known him? Verse 9. Everyone who has been begotten of God does not sin because his seed abides in him. Now, who, what, his seed, uh, well, that's associated with the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is associated with Christ, who is the Word of God. <laughs> so, if his seed abides in you, uh, it goes on to say, and he is not able to sin because he has been born of God. If you're dead to sin, you can't sin. Okay? In your inner man, united with Christ, you're as holy as he is holy, you're as righteous as he is holy, and if you could sin, you wouldn't be as righteous as that. You would no longer be righteous if you could sin in your inner man. Jesus said, the one who sins is a slave of sin. But the Son shall make you free. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. The point is, if you could sin, now you would become a slave of sin all over again. But we can never become a slave of sin again because we can't sin anymore. And I just want you to know your identity is not with the flesh. It's who you are in Christ that identifies you. Amen. Yeah. And, and, and so what I am describing is who you are on the inside. <laughs> this is your true self. And you are being conformed to who you are inwardly uh, by God's sanctifying work through that Holy Spirit of His. Uh, and so through discipline and uh, all kinds of ways, growing in the knowledge of him, um, uh, through one another's encouragement, we, we, we began to take on in our actions uh, and in our sentiments his, his character, his heart and mind. We're given the mind of Christ, but it, it's also at the same time being renewed by uh, well, mainly, I think, the, uh, the knowledge of him through his word and through the uh, ministry of the Spirit uh, teaching us uh, the things that are freely given to us by God. And, uh, and again, it goes back to, uh, I, for me, at least, it's, it's mostly through his word that I learn all these things. Uh, let me... Let me uh, Again, I, I encourage you to read the paper Dead to Sin, Alive to God, because I go into uh, that whole thing about uh, how the f spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead will put to death the deeds of your mortal body. And that's it. It's, his ministry in you is to mortify uh, the, uh, I guess, the inertia, the, uh, I think, think of that word, uh, the tendency of the flesh to sin. And so by, it puts to death the pro proclivity, that's the word, of the flesh. And in its place, it gives life to your mortal bodies. Um, and, and life is, in the context, it's, it's code for righteousness. Uh, in Romans 8, uh, 13, But if by the Spirit, and this, he just finished talking about the Spirit of the one who raised him from the dead, if, the, if by the Spirit you put to death the practices or, uh, of the body you will live, 
that's verse uh, 13, verse uh, 12 or 11, he says, uh, if the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also make your mortal bodies live through the indwelling of his spirit. So, so putting to death the practices of the body and giving life through your mortal body is the ministry of the spirit. So we do righteousness through this body because of the ministry of the spirit. He puts to death what the body would naturally do because it's dead in sin and instead produces the fruits of the Holy Spirit, righteousness. And that's an that's extremely important work of the Spirit. In conclusion, um, I wanted to just share with you real quickly, thanks for bearing with me through all this. I've gone through a lot of material. <laughs> you guys have been very patient with me. I have a little... It's on your flash drive also. It's just this one page, and it's called The Ministry of the Spirit. And I, I'll just, uh, I'll leave off the references because you probably know them when you hear them, and then I'll be done, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Given the importance of walking in the Spirit, because it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing, it is encouraging to see just how complete the role of the Holy Spirit is in our life. Under the terms of the New Covenant, we enter into the Lord's rest through faith. And that ensures that the child of God is... Now, hold on to your seats. Buckle in. We are begun by the Spirit, born of the Spirit given life by the Spirit, baptized into Christ Jesus by the Spirit to become dead to sin and alive to God, regenerated and renewed by the Spirit, washed, sanctified, and justified by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, given liberty by the Spirit, strengthened with might in the inner man by the Spirit, given wisdom. <clears throat> These are just quotes from Scripture here. <laughs> given wisdom by the Spirit, gifted by the Spirit, incorporated into the body of Christ by the Spirit, sealed, that, that word incorporated is the word baptizo, so it's, it, baptizo uh, means to be united with or incorporated into. So, so you're, if you're baptized into Christ, you're incorporated into Christ. So you're incorporated, that word baptizo, into the body of Christ. You're sealed with the Spirit. You're taught by the Spirit. You're given the ability to know the things freely given by God, by the Spirit. You're given assurance of adoption as sons of God, by the Spirit. You're assured that Jesus Christ abides within you by the Spirit. You're helped in prayer through intercession by His Spirit. And by the way, He intercedes for us through His Spirit in in uh, Romans 8, but then he intercedes for us, uh, I think it's Hebrews 7. You know, you know, he's the high priest who intercedes for us. So there's a connection again of the same ministry by Jesus is through his spirit. Um, we're shown the will of God by the spirit. That's an Acts passage of that of Acts. We're made into an epistle of Christ by the Spirit. We're empowered to walk in righteousness by the Spirit. That's 2 Corinthians 3. We're empowered to mortify the practices of the body, and we're made to live in the Spirit so as to walk in the Spirit, thereby exhibiting the righteous fruits of the Spirit. What's missing? <laughs> it's all there. I just want you to know, you are living in eternity. You are now in union with the Supreme, Most High, Holy God. You have life post-judgment. You are, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You're seated in Christ, not here, but in the heavenlies. This is where you truly exist. Christ is your life, and to live is Christ with whom you are in perpetual, holy, eternal union. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you.